Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of Unlimited Opinions. I'm Adam Bishop. And I'm Mark Bishop. And today we are discussing the third chapter, yeah, third chapter of Anthony Kenny's A New History of Western Philosophy, and that is How to Argue Logic. We are also discussing other topics that come up. Yes, but the, the, the main <laughs> the main goal is to discuss this, this chapter That is here. correct. That is our jumping off point. Yes. Right. So and we're you, going to talk about logic. Yes, and you said that you had a logic joke that I you wanted to start I did have a logic joke, and I didn't want to forget it, so I wrote it down. Oh. And it goes such as this. Logical fallacies are annoying. Therefore, people who don't know about them are annoying. That's really terrible. <laughs> that's a great logic that's, joke. That's, that's not a, a good joke. That's a perfect <laughs> logic joke. About fallacies, because well, the, the conclusion doesn't... It might be a good logic joke, but I think in the grand scheme of jokes, it doesn't doesn't hit too high on and, and well, just <laughs> cards of comedy. <laughs> it wasn't my best work, but yeah, uh, no. I liked that joke. I'm glad you like it. Yeah. Do you want, another, you want a better joke? Sure, let's hear so, another joke. Uh, well, uh, so I was in the, uh, uh, the bar the other day with Rene Descartes, mm-hmm. and... Uh, and uh, and I said, uh, hey, Rene, you want another beer? And he says, I think not. Poof, he disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. That's, that's a pretty good one. That's right. a pretty good one. Yeah. Anyway, me and Rene go way back. No, you don't. Anyway, <laughs> let's start talking about kind of the roots of logic here. Um, and Aristotle really claims to be the founder of logic, and that's, that's a good you know, claim to make. Uh, I think we'll talk about here about all of his different logical principles, uh, but really we can kind of trace the very origins of logic really kind of back to Plato in a way um, with his distinctions between nouns and verbs and how there must be a noun and a verb and a sentence. And it's really from there with uh, that sort of teaching of Plato that Aristotle used to kind of use as a springboard for the rest of his logical teachings. Yeah, I think, uh, who was it? I was, I meant to highlight a quote, but is it from Kant? Who was, was somebody was talking about uh, Aristotle's claim to be the, you know, the, or, the, or the people that claim that Aristotle's the, the founder of logic, mm-hmm. and um, I forget what the quote was now. It was something along the lines of, you know, uh, people didn't start uh, reasoning logically just be, just when Aristotle came along. I think it's this quote from John Locke here. There, John yeah. Locke, that's right. He says, "God did not make men barely two legged and leave it to Aristotle to make them rational." God, that's a really brilliant way to put it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, he, he uh, obviously um, composed, you know, his books or his writings that uh, formalized, you know, a, a logic. And, and, and I thought you'd be, when I was reading this, I was thinking you might be fascinated by yeah. it because it, it's, it's so intertwined with linguistics. Mm-hmm. That's really the most of what it is, is really just linguistics. Right. And that's and, much, yeah. And, yeah. And analysis of, mm-hmm. of writing and, lo- and logic within the grammar and the, how we use words yeah. to basically frame our opinions. So, what's the bottom line thing that you drew from this, this chapter? What's the big thing that jumped out at you? Uh, well. It's, it's really a lot of little things that's really just kind of the basis of the chapter. I don't know if I can pick one basic thing. I mean, if I guess if we go to just the most basic form of logic, it'd be Aristotle's syllog- uh, syllogistic. Um, I guess that's really the main principle of this chapter. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, I mean that's that, the point of the chapter. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like, uh, uh, but uh, you, you didn't draw any like general conclusions or. General conclusions? It's very impressive how Aristotle characterized all of these different forms of speech basically why is that why is it so impressive well because we jump from plato who had just characterized nouns and verbs and we jump to aristotle who has characterized basically everything else yeah so i think that's impressive it is impressive Mm -hmm. yes all right so what do we want to kind of go through what uh anthony kenny's he treats it what it was kind of interesting reading because i was expecting more of an analysis of logic, but that's really not the point of the book. The book is a history of philosophy, and so he kind of he gave more or less the history of uh, of logic in, in this period of Aristotle and his and the people that followed him, right? Yes. So you want to go through that a little bit? Absolutely. All right, I, I'm waiting for you to. That's kind of like my. I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting you jump off yes. with that. Yeah. So uh, I think that the first thing that Kenny starts off with is Aristotle's syllogistic, which is really the most basic of all of his forms of logic. Like I was saying. Uh, and it's really um, just the central method of inference, and the most popular example of that is these three propositions. Uh, every Greek is human, 
every human is mortal, and therefore every Greek is mortal. So it's really just drawing a chain from two true statements to form a third true statement that wasn't really explicitly stated earlier. Right, and, and when you get into uh, more, you know, formal logic, and and, and late, well, I assume it'll be dealt with a little bit more in later chapters. But when you study logic, it, it really is uh, the, creating the structure for for analyzing arguments is is really helpful. I, I always enjoyed it. It's almost it's combining, and I think you really like it too because it combines uh, linguistics with mm-hmm. math essentially. Yeah, and uh, and it's important when you when you go through logic that you are paying attention to it's not it's, it's a search for truth but it, you're really trying to analyze whether an argument is valid or mm-hmm. not and it's not whether it's true or not or the truth or falsity of it it's whether or not it can be proved true or proved false because if you have false premises then you're going to get a false conclusion with a valid argument yeah, yeah exactly yeah uh really with the syllogistic there's three forms that uh or there's three uh, different classes of words that are kind of necessary to use here you just made the stupidest <laughs> face i think i've ever seen um our, our viewers didn't have the camera on me yeah so. unfortunately yeah. <laughs> and so there's really three three terms and, he, and aristotle uses terms as basically just a just a part of speech that's important to these syllog, uh, syllogisms uh the first of the terms is the major term uh, and that is the predicate of the conclusion. Uh, the term uh, of which the major is predicated in the conclusion is the minor term, and the term that appears in each of the premises is the middle term. So in the example that I gave earlier, uh, mortal is the major term, Greek is the minor term, and, my, and human is the middle term. So we kind of go from every Greek is human, every human is mortal, every Greek is mortal, using all three of those terms to come to our final conclusion. At any point during the, your reading of this chapter, did you also... Think of uh, Schoolhouse Rock and, and like uh, conjunction junction. What's your function? And, a little bit, a little uh, bit. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, I was thinking. Uh, I didn't think about Schoolhouse Rock. I thought about conjunctions, but I yes. didn't really connect the dots all the way to Schoolhouse Rock. <laughs> That's the. I had that in my head. I was always reading. I bet you did. It was a little off putting because normally it's clown music. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I'm feeling much better this week, by the way. Last week, I was a little under the weather. Now, I'm I'm firing on all cylinders, uh, all philosophical cylinders. Yes, I can tell. And so, uh, really, moving on through uh, Aristotle's syllogistics, um, there's kind of five rules that things have to follow in order for, like, a proposition to be valid. Um, And the first rule is that at least one of the premises must be universal. Uh, The second is that at least one premise must be affirmative. And three... uh, of of either if either premises is negative then the conclusion must be negative um and then the fourth and fifth rules are that the major premise must be universal and the minor premise must be affirmative so really we kind of go through these different types of pr- uh, propositions as well with these premises uh the affirmative and the negative and the universal and the particular um and this is really kind of breaking it down into the details of things uh where there's universal premises universal propositions that are always true no matter what um, which is kind of like the statement that um, every Greek is human. That is a universal affirmative truth. Um, uh, and then the universal negatives would be the opposite of that. So every Greek is not a horse. Uh, and then we have particular uh, affirmatives and negatives. So that's uh, some Greeks have beards and some Greeks do not have beards. So really just drawing all these distinctions between different premises and different propositions to later judge their validity. I've heard that there's some Greeks that are asses. <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with anything. Well, he said no, uh, no Greeks are horses. Oh, but yes. some of them might be asses. It's potentially, yes. potentially, those Greeks. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, I, I don't know if I really want to comment about his his uh, you know the, the whole uh, principles that he sets forth there, but uh, uh, I was I was interested in uh, one of my, well, I guess maybe one of my more favorite philosophers Kant had said about Aristotle that logic had neither advanced a single step nor had been required to retrace a single step since Aristotle. Hmm. That's so, interesting. Yeah. He was wrong, of course. What was he? Yes. Why was he wrong? Because uh, logic did advance. Um, it took a long time before it, it probably, I guess it was after Kant, but with the with more advanced more advanced formal logic, it, it they really developed it a lot better as far as dealing with contingencies and, mm-hmm. and that 
but uh, well, I'm sure we'll get into that later. I'm sure we will. But it was very high praise for Manuel yes. Kant. Yes. Uh, then moving on, um, I don't know, is there anything else that you want to add uh, to Aristotle's syllogistic? No, not really. All I right. mean, I, I think it's uh, it's an interesting uh, description of his theories mm-hmm. and how it developed, and then, you know, moving on to the, you know, his followers who were kind of had their own theories about logic, which I think complemented yes. Aristotle's as opposed to, you know, where there wasn't really a critical of it. It was just kind of complementary to it. Mm-hmm. And Aristotle kind of goes on uh, with his De Interpretation and the Categories, um, which is really just kind of expanding on his syllogistic and exploring not just like the framework of logic itself, but how different premises relate to each other and the subcategories of how we can get into all these linguistic differences, which this stuff is really interesting to me. Uh, probably not too interesting to most other people, but... Including me. But yes, go ahead. It's really just, yeah, down into the details. Yeah, why, why, why does this interest you? What, what about it? I don't know. It's just like breaking down like a lot of things that we just kind of take for granted um but we just like um, automatically know and then breaking it down into like just definite descriptions of things um it's just really fascinating to me. like articulating the structure that yes. you're just kind of born knowing or raised yes. knowing hmm. interesting it reminds me of this thing there's like a certain order of adjectives that we put before nouns without even realizing it uh for example it's like um great green dragon that that sounds correct but if we say green great dragon, there's just something about that that's off-putting to us. And it's just like, well, why does that make any sense? And there is actually like all of the different types of adjectives are categorized um, into what they actually mean. And there is a certain order. There's like 15 different types of adjectives. And if we mix up that order, something subconsciously just tells us that that is wrong. Uh, it's just fascinating that we've been able to identify all those things. And so who identified the, fi- the order of the fifteen? Us collectively, I guess. No, I mean, like, is there a book that says there are 15 and I'm this is the order? I'm sure there was a particular person, but I don't know who it is. I guess you must have read this somewhere because this is the first I've ever heard of it. Mm. I didn't read it from the original source. I've only oh, heard it. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not interrogating yeah, you. Yeah, I know. It's... So, so that, that's a known thing in, yes. in linguistics. Mm-hmm. Is there is a particular order of, I mean, it makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. I've just never heard it before. Yeah. Huh. Mm-hmm. Anyway, <laughs> so what's the what's the boss of the adjectives? The the boss of the yeah, adjectives. Yeah, like the number one. I forget which, which one comes really first. Good. I don't know because there's so many of them, and it seems arbitrary if you're just looking at it. But then once you actually like hear sentences, like what's so particular about green great dragon that sounds bad? Yeah, that's right. And there's nothing in particular that we can say, but we just know intuitively that that is wrong, and it should be great green dragon. Well, I guess only if you have two great. If you have two great dragons and one is green and one is blue, then you would say the blue great dragon. But then great be kind of comes a part of the noun, and it's yes. not so much an adjective anymore. Oh, interesting. So it would be like a gr- the great dragons oh. as collectively. Yeah, yeah fascinating. So, yeah, so, so this interested you in, the, in that sense because it, it kind of articulates the, the structure yes. uh, of, of how we think and, and articulate. It's, kind of, it's also interesting to me that he's dealing, of course, in Greek. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so we're having to, uh, having to translate it. Uh, I assume it translated to Latin and then to English, but uh, maybe maybe somebody has translated from Greek to English. But it's got to lose something in translation, mm-hmm. I assume. Or maybe gain something. Well, actually, that's talked about a little bit later, and I think we'll oh, discuss let's, that let's a little discuss bit. That. Well, let's discuss, oh, discuss that, that now. now. Yeah, I think that. that's uh, in the Stoic um, field of, logi- of logic um, where they kind of lose part of their argument because they don't have like apostrophes mm. for certain words. And so like defining when you're using that actual term or when you're, you're just like uh, stating it as the term itself, like with names or something like um, Adam um, is a name. You would put Adam in apostrophes there, but then you would say like uh, Adam is doing something that's using Adam uh, as its own use, as its own word, and not just as the term separately from like the rest of the sentence. Oh, yeah. I was wondering. It seemed like they were overthinking it. Mm-hmm. But they have to kind of define those things because there's no like symbol for separating the term from its use. Oh, see, I was reading that, and that was kind of confusing me. Mm-hmm. Thank you for explaining to me. You're welcome. <laughs> No, I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, Mm -hmm. because I was like, I I didn't quite get it, but that makes Mm -hmm. a lot more sense now you put it that way. Huh. Mm -hmm. And the first distinction that Aristotle kind of makes going on from that is the distinction between uh, complex propositions and simple uh, propositions. And those are that are complex have to be either true or false. And simple are kind of neither true or false, depending on the situation. Um, It's really 
kind of interesting, but really kind of into the details, which are complex and which are simple uh, when you get really down to things. But it's a very in-depth look at all of these different uh, scenarios in which they're complex or simple. You look like you had something to add. <laughs> I don't know what you're... Well, I was going to say, uh, you know, uh, sometimes there are uh, complex propositions and sometimes there are simple ones. Like a, a simple one would be when you go up to a girl in a bar and say, hey, baby, want to go out? And a more complex one is when you tell her a joke or something that lead into it. Have you ever let in with your logic jokes? <laughs> it's been a long time since I've, uh, <laughs> I've flirted with a woman, so... Uh, I don't think I used any logic jokes no, on your mother. That's, that's unfortunate. <clears throat> it is, actually. I think she would have been bemused. Your I, mother's an odd sort. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I'm not going to disagree with that. Did I ever tell you uh, what I proposed that we do on our first date? Of what? Her? Like when I first met her. Mm -hmm. I met her, met her uh, when she was in college at Mizzou. Did I ever tell you what I said we should do on our first date? I don't think so. I've never told you this. I don't think so. I said we should fly a kite. <laughs> <laughs> and she still went out with you. That's right. But we did not fly a kite oh, on the first day. That's disappointing. It was to me. Yes. Why did you want to fly a kite so bad? You know, I, I'm sure I articulated it that night. I had a long-winded... I'm not sure how many words your mother said that first night that we met. Because I said a lot of things. Yes. Uh, but uh, I was charming enough that she gave me her phone number. Yes. And the rest is history. The rest is history. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but so that, um, whatever that preposition was that I proposed to her and worked. <laughs> I, apparently. Or is it a proposition? That is a proposition. Proposition, yes. You propose <laughs> that you go fly a kite. <laughs> That's such a strange thing to say to a person. And we ended up, we ended up flying a kite at some point. Did you? Yes. Uh, your dreams were finally, finally realized. Realized, that's right. I was making a joke about the word preposition. A prep, yes. yes. Okay. I didn't know if you got that. Yes, I caught that. All right, you didn't laugh enough. Oh, I'm so sorry. All right, so where were we at? Back to... Uh, the de interpretation and the categories. I thought we were in the Stoics already. Oh, were we in the Stoics? I was going to mention some more about the categories. We'll mention a little bit more, then we'll go to Stoics. Okay, I was going to say that... Um, Aristotle uh, thought that he was not only just classifying expression uh, in pieces of languages, he saw himself as making a classification of extra-linguistic entities. So it's like the things that are mm -hmm. signified by words as opposed to just like the distinctions between words. So that's really kind of why he's putting out that this linguistic definition even matters. Um, really kind of, I mean, I'm sure you're not too interested in the details of linguistics, and this is kind of... I a, am. Well, I know, I know you are, but not... Our, our, view, our listener is. Our, our listener, <laughs> singular? <laughs> Probably very likely at this point. You already made the Greek mad uh, earlier in the episode. So it's the, the Macedonian, the Greek, and the uh, pro-choice person. They're all gone. Man, that's, there's a joke somewhere. Macedonian, a Greek, and a pro-life person going to a bar. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I have the punchline would be next week. <laughs> but... Back to Aristotle's kind of argument about why linguistics matters is that we're not just arguing over the definitions of words. We're arguing about the sig significance of those words. So we're not just referring to the words themselves and how they're used. We're referring to like the things they represent, the people they represent, the ideas they represent, and how those are valid or not valid, and not just whether or not the sentences are valid or invalid. Right, right. Yeah, and, and not talking about just whether it is true currently. The yes. The validity of it, I think, yes. is the, the point. But. But of course, it's important. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, it's an ultimate search for truth, but yes. uh, and this is a mechanism for it. But mm -hmm. all right, what else? Anything else about Aristotle's categories before we go to the Stoics? Uh, not too much. I mean, he kind of puts forward, like I was saying earlier, some of those like early uh, classifications of just adjectives and that sort of thing. Uh, just that long string of just everything that goes into language and whether or not. Uh, those individual things and validate other individual parts of language and that sort of thing. I guess in a very real way, Plato and Aristotle were really the first linguists yeah. to study the language. I wonder if there are any others, because you know, I don't know anything about linguistics, but I wonder if there's any others in the history of linguistics. I haven't looked too much into the history of it. Interesting. I should. I, I, I'll bet you they're, I bet you they're going to identify Plato and Aristotle as... Probably. As I them. would not be surprised. 
So did you want to go into time and modality, or did you want to move right into right, the right, right, time and modality? Time is modality. It, is anything anybody, yeah, are you interested at all? In time I'll just kind of mention it briefly, uh, just the difference. Just, between... just whether or not you can be, like something can be true now, but mm-hmm. false later, yes. or vice versa. Mm-hmm. And it's an important discussion mm-hmm. because uh, you need to address that in, mm-hmm. in your arguments and in the logic. And, and you have to have that contingency that, the reality can change over mm-hmm. time, and so your arguments and your logic have to be able to address that. And it breaks kind of like down into whether it's necessary for something to be true and that sort of thing. So it's like um, saying that there will be a battle tomorrow uh, is not a necessary thing. There's no necessity that it will happen. But if we're looking like 30 years into the future and we say that there was a sea battle on this specific date, that is a necessity because it is a past event that is true, and so it is necessary for future arguments. Right. It has happened already. Yes, it has happened already, and so it can't be proven and true. It, and it cannot be changed now that it has happened. Yes. Even yes. though some people think that you can change time. Who, who thinks that? I don't know. Some philosophers. I mean, why does time... We, did we talk about this in a previous episode? Why does time go forward yes. and not backwards? Yes, we did talk about that. Well, if it went backwards, then the, the stuff that we think is in the future would be known to be true in that argument that we just talked about that yes. that is just the stuff in the past is either true or not. But if time goes backwards as we know it, then the opposite is true. Because what has what is going to happen has already happened, but what has happened b- before us has not yet. Yes. You but I mean, it all breaks down into like how we perceive time. I think that's what I was kind of saying the last episode. Because I mean, we could be perceiving time like you're saying as it's moving forward, but we don't know really if that's how the world works. Like what if we end life as a tiny child and we begin life as a very old person? That's what I'm saying. Yes. So, so then, then logically you would know, or you could know the truth of what has not yet happened as we understand it. Yes. In a way. And so yes. all that is wrong that they're saying. You know, if, if time can go backwards, but my, my I'm asserting is that time cannot go backwards because it's unknown what will happen and what we know is the future. What it, the stuff that has already happened to us is not changing. Yes. It has never changed. It has already happened. It will never be altered. But this, the stuff that is yet to come is unknown. Now, if you believe in like determinism mm-hmm. and fatalism, Maybe everything is already known. Like yes. Let's say God knows all. Does does God know the future of what we are going to choose? You know, whether if we make a decision five years from now that is like a, a turning point in your life, and you decide to do something bad, mm-hmm. and you do and you do that bad. Does God already know you're going to do that bad thing? Yes. How does He know that? Because He knows everything. But that is not yet a thing. Well, like that kind of goes like... if he already knows it, do you really have a choice? Well, that's kind of... That's something I've thought a lot about, and I've kind of like come up with my own arguments like against that, so... If you, against what? Against that we... Against the idea that uh, a, a fully knowledgeable God negates free will, um, because I don't think that's... Okay, yeah, that's tell me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, you kind of look at like God almost like as a, as a time traveler in a way, in that, you know, a time travel can look 30 years in the future... And they can see events that happen 30 years in the future, but did they did not in themselves cause those events. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, if there's, yeah. 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 That's, that's your, that's, that's what is, yeah, that's, that's the basis of my argument really. Cause Except it's like for the time traveler didn't, didn't create everything. And that kind of goes and, into and, and the time traveler does not know what is going to happen because it hasn't happened yet. But they can go back in time to the point where they came from and know what is going to happen. Well, in your yes. theory, but that can't happen because it has already happened and they haven't gone back. I suppose so. Because they would have gone back already. Well, they, I mean, kind of, like, I've, I've kind of come up with a different analogy as well, almost like a... So it's like the butterfly effect. Right? Yeah. Uh, there's a description of, uh, of, of time travel and there's a story about, uh, you know, the, the, they go back in a time and somebody steps off the path and kills a butterfly. Yes. And they go back into their present time, which is the future for mm-hmm. the dinosaurs, and, and the whole world's different. You yeah. Know? Well, how would the world be different when that had already happened? Mm-hmm. And so my argument against uh, Back to the Future yes. is that 
is that he's he's got a picture of his family and they're disappearing off the yeah. picture. How does that How's change that, yeah. that physical thing mm-hmm. that is not contingent upon future or past yeah. uh, things happening? Mm-hmm. So my argument would be he went back. He already went. If he went back in time, he already went back in time. Mm-hmm. And so what they should have had is that everything he did ended up causing who he ended up being, which is Marty McFly as he was at the beginning of the movie, as yes. opposed to cool Marty McFly and the cool family at the end. Yes. Whatever he did screwed it up so that they ended up being dorks. Yeah. Like at the beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. That would have been my preference yes. for it. But, but be that as it may. Yeah, but kind of, well, I kind of wanted I to. I don't think, I, I don't think if God, if God already knows what you're going to do, do you really have a choice? You know, I mean, it's already you've already you've kind of already chosen. And what what is what is going into that choice? I mean, uh, if if he already knows what you're going to do 10, 15 fifteen years from now, could you could you do anything different? It's well, already happened in a sense because it's ha- even though it's happened in our future to him or her or whatever, it's already done. And where does your moral reasoning come well, in? I kind of like. A different analogy to use is almost like God's like a, a video game developer in a way, like making an AI. Like you can make the environment that like the AI moves around in, um, and you can make like what like kind of sort of the framework for the choices that the AI will make, and you can even kind of predict what the AI will do um, just based on like the code you write. But once you like press start on the simulation or anything, you are not actively controlling that AI in this environment that you've created you're not pressing the buttons to move it left right up and down it is doing that on its own even though you gave it the ability to do so but it only but it, it's like playing a movie because it only do, it only plays one version of the game because he already knows what you've chosen mm-hmm. five years from now so isn't it more like he's made a movie and he's just watching it back I mean, I like to watch old movies I've watched before, yes. but he just likes to watch us do it again because we've already done it for him because time, God would be outside of time because time is physical. Yes. So God would be outside of time. So isn't it just he's just watching something we've already done for him because he's before and after and, 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 and I'm using the him. But mm-hmm. just, well, no, because he is outside of time. Uh so nothing is before or after to him. So there really is. So it's it's just impossible to wrap our minds minds around it because he is just completely out of time. And so there's no logical explanation for us to reason through this. What? So, because he's outside of time. So there is no before or after for him. And so it doesn't matter. Time doesn't matter to him in a way because it's inconsequential really well i'm not saying it matters to him at all yes but if he already knows what we've chosen then we've already chosen it before we've chosen it but it is not before or after for him it's just i don't think i don't think if we have free will god can know what we're going to do i disagree i don't i don't think it exists for god for us or anyone else until we've chosen to do it I don't think it exists. Mm-hmm. I think I think your analogy is is, is right in that he you know, like he creates a simulation or creates a game or create, you know, creates the universe mm-hmm. and it's developing. But how does God know how it's going to end? If if the players have their own choices to make and they can go A B C or D, mm-hmm. if he is not uh, controlling that, I don't think they. I don't think he can know or God can know what their choices are before they've made them. They don't exist yet. Mm -hmm. They don't exist until those choices are made. Oh, yeah, I guess. I'll have to to think of a, think of a counterpoint to that for next, for next week. Well, the counterpoint is, uh, determinism, fatalism, Mm -hmm. and we don't really have a choice. It's all an illusion, which I would, I would disagree. I would say there is a possibility where free will, will and an infinitely knowledgeable God exists. He's infinitely knowledgeable yes. about things that exist. I think about things that will exist. Hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. We could talk about that next episode. I think we've spent quite yes. a bit of time on this topic. Excellent. All right. Mm-hmm. And do we have anything else to talk about, about the Stoics? The Stoics. The... Um, I do really like this case by um, Diodorus, um, kind of his framework of a logical 
argument and Diodorus was a stoic of course um and he kind of course. puts yes because everybody knows everybody knows Diodorus is a stoic <laughs> uh <laughs> common knowledge and so uh, he puts forth these five kind of rules for a logical argument and how logic can build on itself uh, and the first rule is that past truths are necessary and then from there on he uses a specific example of nautilus which is a shell in a little pool um in the shell and it cannot be seen um so he kind of puts forth these four statements that are all contingent on each other uh, on the first contingency that past truths are necessary. Uh, the second is that Nautilus will not ever be seen. Uh, the third is that it has always been the case that Nautilus will not ever be seen, which is a plausible consequence of that uh, step before it. Uh, and the fourth is that it is necessary that Nautilus will not ever be seen. And that is based on uh, the first uh, rule, because um, if past truths are necessary and it has been true in the past that Nautilus will not ever be seen, then it must be necessary that it will not ever be seen again in the future. I did not follow that. Yeah. But go ahead. And then the fifth is that it is impossible that Nautilus will ever be seen, and that's the culmination of all of those. So what you didn't you follow about that? I don't follow the logic behind that, that those last three flow from the first two. Well, if we say that Nautilus will not ever be seen... Oh, and, that's a premise. Yes. Very well. Yes. And I accept it. That's yes. the premise. Yes. Right, right, right. So the premise so then, that he has not been seen before. Okay, got it. Yes. All right. I missed so, that it's, point. so if it's true at one point in the past that it will not ever be seen in the future, then it is impossible by yes. inherent yeah, logic right. that it will never be seen in the future. Got it. Yes. Thank you for clarifying yes. that for me. You're welcome. That, that's the second time you. this episode. Yes. I think that's the second time ever, probably. <laughs> that, that I've ever acknowledged it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, uh, while you're uh, thinking of your next thought, I'll tell our uh, listener about uh, uh, the times when you and your older brother would uh, uh, start becoming, in, in some areas, more knowledgeable than me, and I would challenge it, and, uh, and uh, you would run to some sort of reference book or Sam would it before you were old enough to do so, and Prove me wrong, and that's when I invented Mark Bishop's Book yes. of Knowledge, and uh, that refuted everything that was contrary to what Mark Bishop says. It's yes. been very handy. Mm -hmm. You think this book is big? Yes, this is only a thousand pages. But the unfortunate thing is, is that Mark Bishop's Book of Knowledge is written on invisible paper in invisible ink, so nobody can really see it except for Mark Bishop. That is correct. And so that, that is that is to keep you all from questioning yes. the wisdom of Mark Bishop. So in a book in a way. This podcast is the new Mark Bishop's Book of Knowledge. <laughs> I think we talked about this when we were first starting to, to make a podcast, is that we needed an actual Mark Bishop's Book of Knowledge. Yes. Well, it exists. You mm -hmm. just can't see it. So speaking of books, um, we need to speak of words. And I think there's one last thing that um, I'd like to talk about here in the Stoic logic. Did uh, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll, yes. Go ahead. Uh, and that thought. there's like three uh, types of, of parts of speech in a way. There's the... Um, let me see if I can find it here. Um, do you want to fill the time for a second? The, the verbal? Yes. The yes, verbal, the verbal part of speech? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, thank you. The words? Well, I was going to say that uh, the speaking of uh, uh, words and books, uh, I, I think my book of knowledge is not quite as voluminous as H.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and Habit. H? What, what is he? It's J. J R R. You know, I had a guy in high school uh, who was known as H R. Really? Yeah. Went by his first two initials. He also had pictures of guns in his locker. Oh, there you go. He never did anything bad. He's a nice guy. Yes, here it is. So the the three uh, kind of distinctions on the theory of language is that there's a distinction between sound, the speech, and the saying. And so the sound and the speech can be kind of understood and repeated by anybody. But language really isn't fully realized until we have that saying. So it's like I speak another language, I can just kind of spout out the sounds of that language, and I can spout out the words of that language. But until I kind of fully comprehend that language, uh, those words and those sounds don't mean anything until we have that comprehension. And I just think that's a really uh, concise and great way to break down, you know, just uh, how language works. It's not just sounds and words, but it's the full understanding of everything that goes into those. And that goes back to a previous discussion we had about Tolkien creating languages yes. that only he knew. Yes. Which means that the Stoics would think that his efforts were pointless as well. Perhaps. Because it, it would not have meaning to anyone else. Well, I don't know if it was just him that knew him. He taught it to like some of his friends and everything. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, primarily is one of was one of Tolkien's closest friends. Um, those are kooky cats. I'd like yeah. to go out and have a beer with those two. Yeah. 
Uh, the, hey, the, their whole group. Oh. Talk Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> Let me You'll you. have to specify which kind. Well, I'll tell you what. Kinds. I would like to know. Do you know any Elvis swear words? I do not. <laughs> That's the first thing you ask anybody. I do not. I mean, the first thing you ask a foreign exchange student. Hey, what are the swear words? I could. I could say like a, a, a dwarvish like call to arms. If that. Oh that yeah, counts. let's yeah. do that. Uh, uh, Kazad I menu. Oh uh, my god. Yes. Uh, yes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm forgetting the first part, but it's the, the, the axis of the dwarves. Uh, the dwarves are charging out, something like that. Um, nice. Kind of into that, yeah. Nice. It's yeah. Kuzdul, uh, the ah. language of the dwarves. Watch your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting discussion on language with all of those that we yes. can break down at some point. All right, we we finished with the Stoics. Is there anything else we want to talk about? I don't it, think there's it, much. This this section was very detail heavy. It was only twenty pages, but right. it was a lot of information packed into those twenty pages. A lot pages. of information about a very brief snippet mm-hmm. of time of philosophers. Speaking of time, you know, just you know, really Aristotle and the Stoics. I yeah. think. I mean, and Aristotle, his uh, one of his followers of the Stoics. So mm-hmm. it's, uh, but it's like that's that's kind of provided the basis for logic throughout right. the rest of all of history yeah, formal logic mm-hmm. yeah, written logic analysis of arguments. yes that's yeah, interesting very interesting yes all right should we wrap the episode up here yes all right well this has been unlimited opinions i've been adam bishop i will be Gary Bishop. Is that necessary? (laughs) Nothing I do is necessary. That's, there's a lot of truth in that.